Let's stand as we worship a great and mighty God. Amen. Oh, I didn't hear you. Amen. Yeah.
so sing that chorus. Hallelujah, by the glory. go to Lord in prayer. Let's remember the uh, victims of the uh, shooting in Pittsburgh at the synagogue. Father, we just come to you. We thank you that, Father, you, you can work all things out for the good. So, Father, we just humbly pray for the, uh, the families that are missing loved ones for today, for the injured. We pray for the ones that are uh, trying to put all the pieces together. Father, may your love work through all this situation and father may you just be glorified even through this terrible situation father we know you're able to do above and beyond anything we can say or ask or even imagine and so we just uh, cast all our cares upon you because you care for us and so father as we worship may you, our worship be pleasing to you may the words that are preached later draw us closer to you may we walk out of here changed willing to share that Jesus is your son is the way, the truth, and the life. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, be seated please. We have a lot of activities going on at the church and yesterday was no exception. We had a little uh, pumpkin patch party. Last chance to get your pumpkin, but that is not the truth, okay? You still have some time to get out there today, tomorrow, Tuesday, and in the snowstorm on Wednesday, you know, come on out. Uh, by the way, in case you don't know, uh, the uh, pumpkin party yesterday was for a church plant, Mission Under Grace. Uh, they'll be planting a church at uh, 6th and uh, Peoria uh, starting in January, and they just wanted to see how uh, it's done properly. There was 23 adult volunteers, student volunteers out there, and it uh, went out uh, real well. And so uh, about 100 people uh, from Facebook, uh, advertisement and just some neighborhood people came and took part in that so that was a good time yesterday afternoon uh, speaking of good time anybody having a good time here at church already yeah. man I like, I like that song uh, you know that high part revive us again I like that part I like that part Mark's like you do okay all right but uh, anyway, <laughs> in the back of your uh, pew in front of you is a Connect card. If you're a guest, we just ask you to take a moment, fill out as much information you feel comfortable with, and then uh, place it in the offering plate when it comes by towards the end of the service. If you have a prayer request or a praise, like I would say, praise God, we sold $750 worth of pumpkins yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> And we take cash, check, and credit card. I could go through my whole spill here, but it's, it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. So anyway, if you volunteered with Pumpkin Patch helping out, we do appreciate that. We do appreciate also Pastor Bobby. He's going to come up here in a minute and have a children's sermon. I think he's going to have a pumpkin. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, so at this time, if you'd like to stand and shake hands with your friends and neighbors, do that. If you don't, then just sit down. I'm sure you will. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, good. We're working. That's good. I never know. Um, how are you guys doing this morning? Good. Did you have fun this morning? Get some rest? I did not get much rest last night, so we're hoping this goes well. Okay, well, it worked better with a youth that didn't get as much rest as me last night, too. So, what's going on this week? Anybody know? 
There's a big holiday happening, kind of. What is it? Just shout it out. Everybody knows. Halloween. Halloween. What do you guys do on Halloween? Go trick-or-treating. Go trick-or-treating. That's right. Get some candy. But do you have any other traditions that you do on Halloween that you do with your family? Yes. Carving Carving pumpkins. Perfect choice. So I did not do much carving when I was your age, but um, when I had Kinley, my daughter, it kind of became one of our traditions uh, that we carve pumpkins every year. And she loves to carve pumpkins. But she went to the pumpkin patch this year, and she wanted a pumpkin her size. So, exhibit A. Now, the best part about this is this came after we already carved pumpkins. Now, because I want to impress my daughter, I decided to carve toothless in my pumpkin this year. It worked. It was awesome. And then one day later, his head fell off. So it, didn't, it only worked a little bit. But she was so excited. She loves carving pumpkins. Do you guys like carving pumpkins or watching somebody carve pumpkins? Hopefully, you're not doing a lot of carving. Hopefully. Um, exactly. That's with a knife. That's dangerous, as my finger would show you. Um, had an accident this week, so that was bad. But um, when we carve pumpkins, we have a lot of fun doing it. And most of the time, we put a face on it, right? Well, Kenley got her pumpkin, and then she goes, Mimi, can you put a face on it? Not going to happen with this little pumpkin, right? Not gonna, probably not going to put a face on that one. That would be really tough to carve. But if you had a lot bigger pumpkin, and she wanted to put a happy face on it, do you guys like putting a happy face on your pumpkin? Yeah, that's pretty cool. We'll go with 50-50. So, we're talking, so right now we're talking 50-50 to the happy face pumpkin people. Okay, but what do you do first when you go to carve a pumpkin? Have you ever watched mom or dad do it? What happens first? Yes. You cut it open, you cut the top off, but you got to cut it nice so that it still fits back on, right? And then you take all the gooey, gross, yucky seeds, all that stuff out, right? You got to clean it out really good. And then after that, what do you do? Yeah, you carve it, you put a happy face on it. We're putting a happy face on our pumpkin, our make-believe bigger pumpkin than this. We're putting a happy face on it, okay? Happy face, okay. After you put the happy face, you carve it out, you clean up your mess, and then what's the last thing you do? You put a candle on it. Yes, and then where do you usually put that pumpkin? Outside, where other people can see it, right? Well, guess what's so cool about the pumpkin? Is the pumpkin is a lot like us, okay? So when we, no, watch out. Here's how it goes. So when... When we ask Jesus to take care of us and we say, we want to follow you, he comes in and gets all that yucky, gross stuff out of our life. And he takes care of all that. He takes care of it all. And it makes us happy. So we put a happy face on. Because we couldn't get all that stuff out by ourselves. There's nothing that we can do to get that out. Unfortunately, we're, we don't always make the best choices as much as we want to. So he gets all of that out, and we put a happy face on our pumpkin. But the last part, what is so cool, is when Jesus, he puts his spirit inside of us, okay, and it acts like a candle, a light of the world, which is pretty cool. And then we put that light inside of us, and it shines bright outside of our pumpkin and our happy face so that everybody else can see it. Right? So... Here's what's so cool about this holiday that's coming up. And we've talked about it for weeks. Pastor Mark's talked about it for weeks. We all get to see and talk to a bunch of different people that may not know about Jesus. And a lot of times they get to come to us. Or we get to see them when we're walking around trick-or-treating. And if we think about that pumpkin, and Jesus took all the bad stuff out of us, and mom and dad, and we say we follow him, We believe in him, and we put his light inside of us, and we shine for everybody else to see. That means we should be sharing that cool message with everybody that we come in contact with. Pretty cool. And we get to be be lights in this world, in this dark world, which is pretty cool. If you think about it, just like we carve a pumpkin, we get all the bad stuff out, we put his light in. So here's what I'm going to do to you guys. I'm going to challenge you guys this week. Go have fun. Eat lots of candy. Be crazy for mom and dad. But share your candy with your dad, okay? Otherwise, 
Otherwise, here's what, here's what happens. Here's what happens. I'm going to tell you right now because I'm a dad, so now I know, and I'm, it's one of my favorite things. If you don't share willingly, we take. <laughs> so my advice to you is, is share willingly, and then we don't take as much, okay? Because we will take. So, but as you guys are doing and having all that fun, you're dressing up as your favorite character. I have to be a shark because my daughter wants me to be a shark. We're going to be a family of sharks. I get to be daddy shark, okay? It's pretty cool. Apparently, I have to sing and dance, too. But that's yet to be seen, okay? But as you guys are having all this fun and you're dressing up and you're getting lots of candy, remember that you are light, okay? And that we want to share that light with everybody that we see, okay? So let's pray and let's remember that we are lights in this world, okay? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time. We thank you for your gift to us, God, that you do get all that bad stuff out of us, that you do pull all the stuff that we can't get out of ourselves, and you cleanse us, Lord, and that you clear it so that you can put your light inside of us, that we might shine bright to this world. Keep us safe as we go about this week, especially as we go have fun on Wednesday, um, uh, and empower us and embolden us to share your truth to the people we come in contact. We love you. We give you all glory. And you hear me pray. Amen. Do you remember the day of your salvation? Do you remember the day that he saved you? Are you still amazed by it? Don't just sing this, but genuinely worship today and be amazed by God's grace. Let's stay. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Had wondered how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean, singing high.
got to put your hands together. All right. Here we go.
that is the case for Mississippi Avenue Baptist Church, that we will be a church who is ready for your return. Father, that we be a church that is being obedient to your commands, to know what it is to be truly blessed, Father, is to become obedient unto you. Father, then glory is brought unto you, and Father, you are exalted. And that, I pray, would be our hope. And Father, I just pray right now, as your word is proclaimed, that our pastor is filled with your Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit of God, convict our hearts unto repentance. Or Father, if you would, draw someone this today. This could be the day of their salvation. In your son's name we praise you. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now I have heard a rumor uh, that Pastor Mitch Hamilton is here. Pastor Mitch, there you are. We're so excited that you're here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. We're praying for you. We love you, you know, for God's favor on all that you're doing. So, so thankful that you're here with us. Now, as you heard uh, already from Bobby, there is a bit of a holiday this week. Um, it's a sad holiday because we don't get a day off of work, right? But um, I, I believe uh, that it is important on the one night a year uh, that people are going door to door and knocking on our doors, and in particular, uh, non-Christians, right? Non-Christians, so we don't have to be the weird kind of Mormon people who go around and knock on their doors. Instead, uh, they're coming to our doors, and they're knocking on our doors. So on Halloween night, they're coming around, they're knocking on our doors, and we should be home, okay? So I think the night uh, that lost people, that non-Christians are knocking on our doors... Uh, and, and with the hope that we're home, uh, that we should be there too. Is that crazy? Like eight of you said it wasn't. So that, that gives me a lot of confidence there. That's good. Thank you for being responsive today. Amen. Valerie, I didn't hear you. Where's Valerie? Oh, come on. All right. She's coming around. So the night that non-Christians are knocking on our doors, we should be there. We should be good neighbors Right? I'll be honest, I don't like it when kids are knocking on our doors and they're dressed up as the devil. Okay? I'm not a fan of that. Um, I think that we should lead our kids to dress up as something make-believe, right? And not uh, as something real that is evil. I mean, I would, I would encourage you to avoid all sorts of evil altogether in your dress, okay, on Halloween. Particularly those things that are real. So we're going to have kids knocking on our door, and I'm going to, I'm going to have that sort of thing in my stomach that's going to be like, oh, I really wish you weren't wearing that. But you know what I'm going to do? Well, do you know what Janet's going to do? I'm going to have the kids. My hope is that Janet will say, hello, we got some candy for you. We got some good candy. We didn't buy the cheap candy. We bought the good candy. There is no such thing as fun with fun size. Amen. Right? So we got some good candy for you, and we have an invitation for your family. So what we're asking you to do is simply be a good neighbor. Be home, or have one of the parents home, if that's possible. Okay? Be home, hand out candy, welcome trick-or-treaters, be kind, be hospitable. Um, people notice, they notice that you're not home on Sunday mornings. Okay? Uh, for those of you who are here often enough, all right? So they notice that you're not there on Sunday morning. So they know that you're, you're a church person, okay? All right? And so be kind, be hospitable, greet them, and represent Christ by being welcoming. And then the one thing we're asking you to do is to consider going the extra mile. It's going to be cold, and so Janet will be home. She's going to have hot chocolate ready for the parents, okay? And for whatever kid that can talk her into it, okay? So she's going to have hot chocolate for them just as a way to go the extra mile, right? You might have some hot dogs for them. You might have some soft drinks for them. What other drinks you might have, just don't let me know. Hot chocolate, coffee, water, soft drinks are good ideas, right? And be ready just to pass them out. Be a good neighbor. So they might be a little bit more interested as you 
hand out simple invitations. So what we've got on a table, and I think the table is almost empty. So if you haven't done it yet, we've got some invitations to Parents Night Out. And we would love for you, as people are knocking on your door, as you give them candy, not an exchange of candy, right? Ain't no kid wants a tract on Halloween. Now they'll take it if you have it with candy, all right? So don't, don't do the Christian, weird Christian thing, like hand them candy if you're going to hand them a tract. So we've got some invitations to Parents Night Out that's free, three hours free child care for guests. It'll be on a Friday night from 6 to 9 p.m. It lets them go out, lets them have fun. We keep their kids safe, okay? And it's a great invitation as a first step into the door of the church. So they're in the foyer for you to pass out when you pass out candy. This is a simple first step in making us a little bit more intentional about making Jesus known in our neighborhoods. Now, let me ask for you to turn today's passage. It's in Revelation 22. That's in the back, okay? It's the last chapter of the Bible. Revelation 22. So if you hit the maps, go back a little bit to the left, okay? Revelation 22 in a moment. I'm going to read starting in verse 6. And if you have the Version Bible app, you can find our service as an event under the More tab. We're going to near the end of the sermon series on the Beatitudes. And a Beatitude is a blessing statement. So you'll see, if you want to glance there at Revelation 22, 7, that there's this blessed are, okay? There's seven blessing statements found in the book of Revelation. Now, this past week, I got some killer new shoes. Okay, love them. Now, I wish I could wear them on a Sunday, but I think some folks would walk out with me wearing sneakers, all right? But they are pretty stinking sweet. They're the perfect size. They're the perfect color, my favorite color, God's own color, which we all know is maroon. Amen? Am I right, Wendell? Can I get an amen? Amen. That's right. They're as comfortable as the day is long, and when I opened that Amazon Prime box, man, I felt blessed. I thought life is good. I can't wait to put these on. I can't wait for Wednesday night. I'm going to wear those things out, right? I'll be the one to run up and knock on the door, right? And then let the kids come up, come up right? I'm excited about them, but... One day, those shoes are going to stretch a little bit. They're no longer going to be my size. They're going to tear. They're going to wear out. The color is going to fade. And they're going to become my yard work shoes. Right? Now, we tend to have a messed up idea of blessing. We tend to define blessing based on something that's temporary. Fading, and one day is going to be discarded. Now, we're walking through the blessing statements in Revelation so that we can have a correct attitude, the right idea of what it really means to be blessed. We're not finding blessing in shoes. We're not finding blessing in what we can buy and what we can own or even in some of the experiences that we have. Those are not blessings. So we're walking through these in Revelation to understand what it means to be truly blessed. Now I'm going to paraphrase John in 22.7. Here's what he basically says. Blessed are those who believe in his prophecy. In the prophecies of Revelation. We're going to look at three parts of this prophecy. And so there's about three ways, three parts to being blessed. Now, not all of them sound like a blessing, and that's what we've been walking through. As we've walked through these blessing statements, some of them don't sound like blessing, right? Some of them were, blessed are those who die. And normally we think that's the opposite of being blessed, but he says, blessed are those who die in the Lord. And what that does is it changes our idea of blessing. God's ideas of blessing are not our own. So the goal is to align what God says about blessing and what we believe about blessing to be the same thing. So join with me 
in reading Revelation 22, 6 and 7. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. The words are going to be on the screen. And we're going to discover again what it means to be blessed according to God's word. That's what John has to say in verse 6 and 7. And he said to me, now an angel is talking to John. And this angel said to John, these words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that your word is trustworthy and true. We're thankful that it was trustworthy and true when you gave it to John, and it's trustworthy and true here today. So help us, Father. Help us to align what it means to be blessed, what we believe blessing is with what your word says it is, with what you say it is. So, Father, we also ask, within this prophecy are just some really hard truths. And for those who do not have a relationship with you, Lord, through Christ, They're going to be hard to hear today. So we ask for your spirit to speak. We ask for your spirit to move. We ask for your spirit to convince those who are not in Christ to find their faith in Jesus Christ today. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. So last week we were in Revelation 20. And there uh, it was a description of what's going to happen before the millennial reign of Christ. And the first thing that happens is um, an angel is going to come, he's going to bind Satan and put him um, somewhere bound for a thousand years. Between last week's passage and today, the thousand years has taken place, Satan was unleashed, and then defeated. He's defeated once and for all. He's bound again never to be released from hell. Then in, verse, and then in chapter 21, where God describes this new creation, a new heaven and a new earth. And then he sends down a new Jerusalem as the eternal dwelling place of his people. And then John describes that new Jerusalem in 21. This is where we get the idea of pearly gates and streets of gold. After this poetic imagery, John records today's passage. I'm going to ask for you to look, just with me again, at 22, 6, and 7. You see, the angel speaking to John offers him these encouraging words. And he says that this prophecy is trustworthy and true. Which means that as we look at the book of Revelation, we see that it is something that we can rely upon. John then records the words of Christ when he says that he is coming soon. He's coming again. Now, this promise is about 2,000 years old. But just because the words are 2,000 years old doesn't mean they're any less true. These are still true words. The potential for Christ's return is imminent. It was imminent 2,000 years ago, and it's still imminent today because God is sovereign over Jesus' return. It's in God's hand. The timing is in his hand. So Jesus could return tomorrow, or he could wait even longer. So the point of this phrase, that Jesus is coming soon, is not that we expect it to happen tomorrow, but we have to be prepared for it. It's supposed to give us a sense of urgency. That because Jesus could return at any moment, we have to make sure that we're ready for it, that we're prepared, and that our loved ones are prepared too. And the greatest preparation that we can do, especially for our loved ones, is to tell those who don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, we can tell them about our relationship and the truth. Okay? We can share with those who do not believe in Jesus about Jesus as a way to prepare them for Jesus' return. Okay? So Jesus is coming soon. As we sing those songs, with the words in the song, it means for us that we have to be prepared that Jesus could come back at any moment. And we prepare for that by telling others about him. Okay? 
to keep the words of the prophecy as he says here. He says, blessed are those who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. What that means is that we believe them and we obey them. So blessed are those who believe in John's prophecy. Blessed are those who keep the words of this book. John's beatitude is a demand to walk worthy of the Lord in light of the fact that he could return any moment. This is how we believe in the prophecy. So, John's beatitude is essentially a summary of Revelation. He says, believe in it all. But let's, let's get a little bit further. Let's go a little bit deeper and see just a few parts of the prophecy that we are to believe, okay? So we're going to spell out three parts of this prophecy that we're to believe in and to obey. The first thing is this. The fact that Jesus will return. Now, I'm going to jump out of Revelation for just a second for us to get a clear picture of this. On the screen is going to be 1 Thessalonians 4.16, where Paul records a prophecy of Jesus' return. Paul writes, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. What, John is, what Paul is explaining there is what John records here. And it's what Jesus says over and over again in his Gospels, that he's coming soon. And we long for and we look forward to Christ's return simply because it brings us hope. This is one of the blessings. Blessed are those who believe in this prophecy, who believe in John's books. Well, one thing we do is we believe that Jesus is coming soon. And so the blessing that we receive is that we have hope. In Titus 2, Paul calls this a blessed hope. The belief that Jesus returns is a blessed hope. Now, let me share a story on hope. A man sentenced to death obtained a reprieve. By convincing the king that he could teach his majesty's horse to fly within a year. On the condition that if he didn't succeed, he'd be put to death at the end of the year. This is a pretty incredible claim, right? Within a year, the man explained, the king may die, or I might die, or the horse might die. And in a year, who knows... Maybe the horse will learn how to fly. Man, that's hope, right? I don't know how wise that hope is, but that is hope, and we all need hope. Hope helps us to face today. Hope helps us face tomorrow. Hope helps us fall asleep. Hope even lets us look death in the face and not flinch. There's a family from our church Pastor Bryce is with them right now. You see, this, the mom of the family is on life support. She had a uh, stroke, and she's been on life support ever since uh, Thursday or Friday. And the, She's receiving all the kinds of care that she can receive that medicine can offer to her. And now they've sort of gone through, explored all those options. Right? There's nothing more that medicine can do. But this family has hope. This family has a belief that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died for their sins, that he rose from the grave, and that he'll come back again one day. Their belief gives them hope. You see, they have hope that no matter what happens, so what they're deciding is when to take her off a of life support when to remove the oxygen tube, when to stop the feeding tube. But they're not there mourning in grief without any hope. They're their confidence that no matter what happens, that they will see her again because she has placed her faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus will return, and that belief gives us hope. That belief helps us face the day. 
That belief allows us that on those difficult days when we have to make impossible decisions, that we have hope to say no matter what happens here, that Jesus is in control. And if the mom comes back to life, praise the Lord. But we know that the, the moment that she stops breathing, that she'll be raised to life. Because she'll be with God. And so no matter what happens, if it's today, if it's tomorrow, when the mom dies, unless God intervenes, we have hope that we will see her again one day. We don't have to flinch. We don't have to cower. We don't have to be afraid of death because we know that Jesus will Return in one day. One day he's going to come back, right? Just as we described, right? With the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and she will be raised again, right? No matter what happens to you or me, right? If you pass or if I die today, we have a confident hope that says no matter what happens, one day, Right? Not only when I take my last breath here do I take my first breath in heaven, but also one day when Jesus comes back with the shout and with a trumpet, I'm raised back to new life. And so we have hope. We have a confidence that we can face no matter what life sends our way. Because Jesus will return. So Christians, let us have hope. Let's not be a people of discouragement. Let's not be a people of despair. Let's be a people of hope. And when people say to us, man, I'm not so sure about this. I don't have any hope about this. We say, you know what? I have hope. And you can too. That when you place your faith, your trust, your belief, a commitment to Jesus Christ, you can have that hope too. Let's delight in the hope. Because Jesus will return one day. But I have to ask you. If you do not believe in Christ, where is your hope? Now, the first point was that we believe that Jesus will return. The next is a belief that God will judge. God will judge. Now, just before the death of actor and comedian W.C. Fields, You see, a friend visited his hospital room and was surprised to see him thumbing through a Bible. His friend, mostly because he had never seen him with a Bible, asked him, what are you doing with a Bible? In which Fields replied, well, I'm looking for loopholes. You see, for W.C. Fields, who was an atheist, the idea of God's judgment is not one of blessing. Right? We just, we're describing blessings here. John is saying, blessed are those who believe in this prophecy. Well, blessed are those who believe that God will judge. Right? So it's not just that my sneakers are awesome. And don't tempt me, but I could wear them next Sunday. Right? If you wouldn't run me off. Okay? Okay? Blessed is not my tennis shoes. Blessed is the fact that one day God will judge. Even if that doesn't sound like a normal blessing. Blessing is that God will judge because God's blessings are different from ours. So it should come as a little surprise that John's prophecy about the end of time contains judgment. Now you can read along on the screen from Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12, where John records these words about God's judgment. John says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. God sits upon his throne at the end of the age, and he judges everyone. There are no loopholes. God judges everyone, young and old, great and small, significant and insignificant. And when John says the dead were judged, the dead were judged according to what they had done, what he means is this. So he's describing books, right? Now, 
Here's the deal. For those of us in Christ, John describes a book of life. Okay? So that when I believe in the fact that Jesus died for my sins, that he rose from the grave, and then I commit my life, not perfectly, but I commit my life to follow him, and then I practice that faith. Okay? When I believe in and follow Jesus, my name is written in the book of life. It's written in a way that it cannot be erased. All right? So I believe in and I follow Jesus Christ. My name is written in the book of life. And anybody else here who has done that, your name is written in the book of life. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Here's the problem is that we may have with us some folks in here who think, you know what, I have always been a Christian. Okay? That they may think, you know what, I've been a Christian ever since I was born. And here's my question for you, if that's you. Let me ask you just a question real quick. Let's say, and heaven forbid this happens, but let's say you have a heart problem. Okay? It's a fixable heart problem. Okay? And let's say... You go and you start visiting with cardiologists, right? And you're visiting with some cardiologist that studied at, you know, let's say Harvard, another cardiologist that, that, that studied at some, somewhere else good, you know, I don't know. Um, and then you, you sit down with a cardiologist who says, you know what, Mark, um, I didn't go to college. You say, okay, what medical school did you go to? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't go to medical school. All right. Tell me more. And the cardiologist simply says, huh, I've always been a cardiologist. Right? Okay, how confident are you that he's going to fix your heart? Right? Someone who says, I've always been a cardiologist. Right? Do you want that guy operating on you? If you do, I've got some, what, oceanfront property in West Texas? Right, to sell you? You don't want a cardiologist who has always been a cardiologist. Because that, that simply doesn't exist. Right? That does not exist. That person does not exist. The same thing is true. Of anyone who says, I've always been a Christian. The only person who's always been a Christian is Jesus. That's not true of any of us. We have to make a decision. We have to believe that Jesus died, believe that he rose from the grave, and then we have to commit to follow him. That's how we become a Christian. Because you're not born a Christian. You're born again as a Christian. Okay? So if you're in this room and you're like, you know what, I am ready to see God one day because I have always been been a Christian, I'm here to warn you that if you have not believed in Jesus, in his death and his resurrection, and then followed him, guess what? Here's the ugly truth of it. Your name is not written in the book of life. If you assume you're a Christian, your name is not in there. There's no one who assumes their way into heaven. Instead, the dead are judged according to what they had done, which means that their sinful deeds condemn them. But if we have faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, His sacrifice removes our condemnation. So Christians, together, let's praise God that we face the judgment of God with Jesus by our side. Our name is in the book of life. Now you may want Him to judge you based on your good deeds. You may think, Okay, I'm going to stand in front of God, and he's going to judge me according to my deeds. And the good thing is that my good deeds outweigh my bad things. But here's the deal. You cannot do enough good deeds to earn your way into heaven. Even if you think that you've done more good things than bad, God is not judging us on our good deeds. He's not even worried how much time you spend at church. That's not how he's going to judge you. What God wants to know is do you believe in and follow Jesus Christ? 
That's the standard that we will be judged. Do we believe in and follow Jesus? So do you believe he's God's son? Do you believe that God loves you and so he sent Jesus to this earth? So that Jesus would die on a cross for your sins, only to be raised bodily from the grave. I have to ask you, if that's not what you believe in, what do you believe in? Now the third and last prophecy, part of the prophecy that we're going to look at today is that God will restore. Jesus will return, God will judge, and then God will restore. Let me read from Revelation 22, 1 through 5. They're going to be on the screen again. It says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and from the Lamb. Through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. Night will be no more, they will need no light of lamp or sun. For the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. The Bible opens in Genesis with God's creating the earth including the first people, Adam and Eve. And then he places them in a perfect garden called Eden. Now in this garden, everything that Adam and Eve could ever possibly need is present. It was also perfectly safe, and even God walked with them, we're told, in the cool of the day. Now you may already know that Adam and Eve then screwed it up. They disobeyed God, and they were kicked out of the garden. So now where things were provided for us, we have to work for what we need. Where we came from a place of security, the world is a dangerous place. And God cannot walk by our side every single day, no matter what the poem Footprints has to say about it. Now here in Revelation 22, John describes what could easily be Eden, only better. There is a river of life, a sacred river flowing from God's throne. The tree of life, which was present in the garden, has now been replanted. It bears plentiful fruit that will provide for eternity. John writes that no longer will there be anything accursed. Adam and Eve's sin brought a curse upon the earth. Jesus' death on the cross defeats that curse. And at his return, he's going to banish it forever. And those in Christ will get to see God's face. Up to this point, no one could see God's face and live. But once God restores, we get to see him. We get to look at him face to face. John tells us that God's name will be on our foreheads. This is not some sort of holy tattoo. Instead, it means that we are his possession and he will protect us. He is ours and we are his for all of eternity. And he will take care of us forever. And last... We'll get to reign with him forever and ever without end. You see, sin is banished. Eden is restored and improved. God walks with his people every single day. Don't you want to be there? Take a second. Let me ask you to think of that perfect vacation spot. Where is your favorite place to go on vacation? For some... It might be a white, sandy beach beside a refreshing ocean. For others, it might be a bright, light-lit city where the only thing better than the food is the people watching. For others, it might be an ancient, hard-to-reach location with a captivating story. And of course, here, we're all a little biased about mountains. You see, eternal life in God's new heaven and new earth And his restored Eden is far greater than we could ever even imagine. Don't you want to be there? Let's pray. Father, 
We're so thankful that you will send Jesus again, that you will judge, and we're blessed that you will restore Eden. We're so rich is your blessing, so amazing is your provision for us, and so we want to thank you. I pray, Lord, if there's anybody here who is struggling with hope, that you'll speak to them, Lord, remind them if they have faith in you of the promises that you have, that you never leave us, you never forsake us, that you will restore us and be with us. And so, Father, we ask for you to give every Christian here hope. And, Father, we're so thankful that when we believe in and we follow Jesus Christ, our name is written in the book of life. For those of us in Jesus, we don't have to worry, Lord. We're so grateful. And that one day when you restore, when you restore this earth to what you intended it to be, that we get to live with you. And so, Father, we ask for you to speak. Holy Spirit, we ask for you to speak. We ask for you to move in someone here with us today who does not believe in Jesus Christ or just assumes that they believe in Jesus Christ, that you will speak directly to them today, that they will become your children that their name will be written in the book of life. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. One of the most incredible promises that we have is that um, when Jesus was talking to his disciples in John chapter 14, he says to them, um, where I am going, um, I'm going to prepare a place for you. So not only... Um, does Jesus uh, die on the cross for us, not only was he raised to new life for us, not only does he then give us uh, an example to follow and a spirit within us, he also, for all of us who are in Jesus Christ, he goes and he prepares a place for us. Okay? And so for those of us who have placed our faith and our trust and commitment in Jesus Christ, He is there preparing a place for us. We're even told that the new Jerusalem is not something he comes to this earth and builds. It's something that he's working on now, and he drops down from the heavens to the new earth when he comes and restores. So when he says he's going to prepare a place for us, he's not joking. But here's the deal. He only goes and prepares a place for his people. That's it. Jesus... Friends, if you are in Christ, Jesus is preparing a place perfectly for you. Man, how exciting is that? Part of me says, I can't wait to see it. So come on, Jesus. Come on this afternoon. Come on, Jesus. Come to this earth. But here's the deal. Thomas, who's you know this great disciple, doubting Thomas, The only time we hear of him is a little bit embarrassing for him, okay? Thomas says, Jesus, um, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. What we're asking you to do today is that if you have always assumed that you are a Christian, assume no more. All right? Assume no more. We're asking you too, if you want a place crafted for you by Jesus Christ, there's some things that you're going to have to do. You have to believe that he died for you. Believe that he rose for you. And commit to follow him. Not perfectly, but you'll have a church family And we'll do our best to help you as you'll do your best to help us too. So we're going to stand down front, the pastors and I. Pastor Bill, Pastor Bobby and I will be down front. We would love to visit with you if you do not, if you have always just assumed and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior intentionally, explicitly. We're here for you as Chris leads in song. We're also here for anybody who's in need. If you need prayer, if you need hope, if you need anything, 
If you'd like to join this church, we're there to help you. So let me ask for you to stand as Chris leads in song. pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this service today. We we thank you for the word that was preached. Father, we ask that you'll just take these offerings that we're returning to you, that they will glorify your name, and that others might come to know you, that their names will be written in the book of life. Just uh, continue to be with our staff as they reach out and preach your word in our communities. For it is in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen. Hey church family, Halloween is three days away. That means if you have yet to buy your pumpkin, you need to do so today. Right after service, we'll take cash, credit cards, your firstborn child, whatever it takes for you to get a pumpkin. Here's the deal, all the profits from pumpkins are gonna be used on missions here in the Denver metro area. For example, there is a church planter in Boulder. His name is Parker Manuel. His church has got this great opportunity where they can pass out backpacks in the Boulder school district with information about their church so with supplies backpacks things like that but also an invite to their church what a great opportunity that we're hoping to raise enough money on our sale of our pumpkins in order to support his ministry and his cause so buy your pumpkin today hi church family pastor bill ingram here advertising the triple l november 8th at 11 a.m 
We have it in the gym. You sign up at the Connect desk, you bring a side dish, and you get to hear me speak about missions. Hopefully that will not keep you from coming, but November 8th, 11 o'clock, sign up at the Connect desk. Hey church leaders, Pastor Bryce here. Just a real quick reminder that we have our leadership meeting tonight at 4 o'clock p.m. right here in the worship center. Please come. We're going to continue our theme for this year of whatever it takes. We're also going to have some important announcements about year-end activities and even some activities next summer. And so I encourage you to attend, to attend, come collaborate with the other leaders, and let's make our leadership team even stronger. See you tonight. Hey, church family, for this fall, we're asking you to participate in simple invitations. So on Halloween night, we're going to ask for you to pass out invitations for Parents' Night Out. And then for Veterans Day, we're asking you to pass out invitations. Here's the deal. So much of our city, so much of our state, so much of our area does not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. A simple invitation like these can be the first step for someone to come to faith. So what we're asking you to do is simple pass out invitations. So please, on your way to the pumpkin patch, grab your simple invitations at the Connect Desk today. Great morning, church family. Pastor Chris here. Uh, I've got on my red, white, and blue. Wait. Oh. I've got on blue and white. So two out of three is not bad. Uh, but could you imagine, as you've heard our challenge from our pastor, what if two out of every three folks you invited actually showed up on Veterans Day. We would pack the house out. So again, our challenge is to take these simple invitations, Veterans Day, November 11th, let us celebrate active duty uh, and also those who have served. But most importantly of all, let us worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See you then. coming up oh. Come on. he's back here I know where he is pastors have some of the hardest most thankless jobs on a the planet they're often expected to be theologians small business gurus advertising executives social justice advocates and brilliant communicators. This is Pastors Appreciation Month. So today, excuse me, today MABC <clears throat> Church Family shows special appreciation by presenting each of our pastors with cards and gifts, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> excuse me, to demonstrate our appreciation to them. Those gifts and cards are being distributed or have been distributed under their desks as we speak. So Pastor Mark and Bryce is not here. Bobby, Chris, and even, Bill. Even Bill. Even, 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 even Bill. We not only appreciate you today, we appreciate you every day. Every day of the year. Church family, thank you so much for letting us uh, feel appreciated. It is uh, a blessing uh, to be your pastors. So um, your gratitude is greatly appreciated. We love you, and Lord willing, we'll be able to serve with you for many, many years to come. Thank you. As always, uh, our staff is going to be waiting at the prayer room to the back side because, again, there might be a decision that's been made for Jesus Christ today and you just didn't feel comfortable or weren't able to walk an aisle. Uh, if you've made that decision, don't hesitate to talk uh, to our pastors in church. 
go get your simple invitations. Let's sing as we head out. Come now, found, come now, King, come now, precious Prince of Peace. Be your bride to you be seen. Come now, found, of our blessed Go be the church. Come now, found, come now, King, come now, precious Prince of Peace. Be your bride to you be seen. Thank you all.